Uh, all right, so first question, Mr. Zello. And by the way, Mike and Cindy were with us last night. If you weren't with us last night, they are the uh, directors at Northern Virginia Teen Challenge, uh, Beauty for Ashes, and um, have been in Teen Challenge uh, since they were in diapers. So they know, <laughs> they know about teen ministry. Um, what, why, why are s so many people dying from drug overdoses in the last few years. Why are we seeing such a huge spike in addiction and overdoses over the last two years? You can stand up. Yeah, so um, um, this is a trend that started in 2015. Um, and every year since 2015, the numbers have increased. And I... Uh, I'll pull this out of my mind. I want to say that in 2015, we had this shocking number of, I think it was 40,000 um, that died from, uh, and specifically, you have to you have to go all the way back to the release of Oxycontin on our society. You have to go all the way back to doctors and pharmaceutical companies that didn't quite understand the implications of long-term opioid use that had a uh, 12-hour release, 20-hour release. And then when those pills were made, they were made to last 12 hours. Or and uh, But <laughs> for whatever reason, they didn't think um, that, that they were abusable. And quickly, addicts started crushing them, breaking them, breaking them down, shooting them, and dying because they were getting 12-hour dose in two seconds. That and then um, the release of another pharmaceutical, uh, fentanyl patch, which, um, you know, that, that's all the word you hear nowadays. There's a lot of things happening with addiction. But in 2015, the number increased dramatically. Um, actually, it started in 2012. But every year there's been, it's it stabilized for a little bit, but there's al always been an increase, always been an increase. Well, then we had this incredibly shocking number in 2019 before COVID, of 70,000 deaths in one year. And that, was, that would be the first time in my lifetime that I would be standing up and preaching and talking about uh, the stadium where the sorry football, redskin, horrible team played football, uh, which seats 73,000 people. And I've been to those games. And some of you have been to football, especially football, because football has the big crowds. And Think about that for a second. When you enter a game, when you leave a game, and you see all those cars, and you see tens of thousands of people, and you realize that in one year, that's how many people died in 2019. Well, we just got the numbers uh, after the first year of COVID, and it's 100,000. And so, it, for whatever reason, the trend has continued, and of course, COVID has made it way worse because of, I listen, the worst enemy of any addict is isolation. And this is what drugs does anyway. It makes you selfish. It makes you inward. It makes you protect the little bit of dope you have. And, and, uh, but COVID gave the excuse for more isolation, more pain. And then I think our government probably compounded that by giving cash to everybody. <laughs> and I'm not sure how many people died because they took that cash and bought fentanyl. But it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, and of course, now, um, if you... If you were to really study addiction and, and, and kind of the way it's working with our border, so three years ago, Mexico was flooded with poppy fields. Flooded. And you could see these aerials, and there's a really good special. Vice News did a, they went down, and you could see these, as far as the eye could see, poppy fields, and they're just surrounded with these guys with machine guns. Entire states in Mexico just kind of broken away, and they're controlled by, you know, gangs, and, and they're, all that's gone. Now, when you see what they're cooking up, they're literally cooking up fentanyl in pots, big pots, like this big, and the guys are using 12-foot sticks to stir it because it's killing them. It's that powerful. They're in hazmat suits with oxygen masks and gloves, and it's still killing them if the wind blows the wrong way. They literally would drop dead and die from the fumes of this stuff. So one half of one penny weight of fentanyl can kill a 250-pound man in three seconds, one half of a penny weight. So when you, you know, watch the news and you hear, you know, there was a fentanyl bust at the border. Ironically, last week was one of the largest drug busts in US history last week. 
but it was mostly cocaine and pot in, out of um, Florida. All I'm just making a long story short. We have a crisis, a horrible crisis, and, and people are dying, and people we know and love have died, Teen Challenge graduates, former staff members, men, men of God, men. People that were in this room two years ago are no longer uh, with us. And the, the part that makes me just cringe the most, we talk about, I mean, we just heard about the demonic release uh, to Generation X. This is a demonic release. It's a demonic release. It's, it's a demonic chemical release. And this tragedy of all this is most of these deaths are accidental. And some of these guys are suicidal because they're addicts. But they're not wanting to die that day. They're not good. They don't think they're going to die that day. Uh, just I was just before we got on the plane and I know I'm rambling, but before we got on the plane, um, I read a story of, of, uh, of a, a party. Um, I forget the city, but it was close to us. It was just a party, just a regular party. And everyone in the house died. And, and you know, I have to wonder, you know, did any of those people and when they were party? Oh, today's the day. It wasn't like that. It wasn't a mass suicide. So the devil is killing people on purpose, and they're dying on accident in their mind. But he's, it's the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, yes, we have a serious crisis right now. And because health care has been hurt, damaged tremendously because of COVID, good luck getting a doctor anything, especially a specialist, surgery, whatever. Um, this is not a priority anymore. Like two years ago, everybody's screaming about the opioid. Now... COVID has taken precedence. It's taken the medical system, it's all their attentions on it. And so what you have is just this, I don't want to use the word ancillary, but th there's this little side thing going on where 100,000 people died in one year. And so, and then you throw suicide and all that on top. But anyways, this is where we are. And unfortunately, uh, you know, some people think the border's wide open and people are just marching across with you. All you need is a backpack full of fentanyl, and you can get the whole Aha Valley high. It doesn't take much to, to you know, and so it's going to be a challenge for us as a society, as a people, and for our government to figure out how to stop this because it's, you can put it in a bottle and just walk across the border, and it's just, we're in for, if we don't have some kind of spiritual thing go on here where our country returns to the Lord, we will continue to see this cancer eat away at people we love. And the tragedy is, these aren't, this is killing people in their 50s. This is my generation isn't dying from fentanyl. It's kids. It's kids. And, and I'm going to close with this, but we had a young man on our staff a couple years. And I mean, I loved him like a son. And three months ago, I stood over his casket and preached his funeral. And in the front row was his wife and four children all under the age of five. And they did something that I've never seen before at a funeral. The casket was open the whole time I preached. So I, I'm looking at my son, and um, he's white, gray. But at the end of the funeral, before they closed the casket, they had all the kids kiss him. And the little one, the little girl, she's like two. She said, Mommy, Daddy's cold. And, I, and it's so demonic it's so demonic and that's why what this brother is saying is true it's all spiritual it's all spiritual 100,000 people were killed it's all spiritual and that's why we have to be armored up because yeah it does feel like we're losing um, and, then I, and then I come to this and I see Anatol and I see you know I was like you no know, nah, we're winning we're winning we're winning we're winning it just it just doesn't feel that way sometimes, but God is good, and, and God is in control. Maybe God is going to break us. Maybe this is all a breaking, all of it. Wars, rumors of wars, COVID, addicts, addiction, alcoholism's up, suicide is through the roof. That's just another one. Maybe this is all a breaking of our country so that we can finally return to our first love. So I'm done. I went too far. Somebody else want to add something to that? Greg, you want anything to say? <laughs> I said no. Um, I don't want to be a pessimist, but just in reality, this problem's, you know, it's not going to go away. Until Jesus comes back, sets up an earthly rule and reign, 
this problem's going to be here. You know, I'm a product of the 60s, you know, um, and I've watched all of the phases. When one drug kind of just gets boring, Satan brings up something else. You know, Anatol is probably old enough in New Orleans. You know, Clickums, that gets boring. Tees and blues, you know, they separate the drug. You can't use that anymore. Then just something else comes up. Powder cocaine, too expensive for most of us. Crack comes on the scene. So it just keeps evolving. And we just can't get tired. That's my message. We can't get tired. We can't get frustrated. We can't get depressed. We can't get overwhelmed. We just keep plugging away. Because there's the Jennifer. There's the Anatols. There's the Mike. There's the... There are success stories. You know, we have to... I hate the ones that we're bearing. And we've all got those stories. I hate that. It's reality. I'm not going to let it get me down to the point that I'm going to quit. I'll just keep going. We're going to reach one. If we lose five, we're going to reach one. Well, also, Team Challenge is a ministry to the few. And, I, and I, this, this, again, has been kind of part of my struggle recently um, because Jonathan alluded to this earlier where the American way is to build bigger, 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 bigger. I, don't, I personally do not believe in big Team Challenge. I, I think the needs of the guys are just too much and the girls and everyone else, there's just too much. They need individual care, individual intentional love, deep love, and a lot of work. All of them. Every single one that comes to the door of this ministry needs a ton of hours from us, a ton of time in the, in the Word, a ton of time in, in, in God's presence. And so, you know, we, we were part of a bigger center, and we, we, we left on purpose to, to get back to deeply loving people one at a time. And so our ministry, our ministry is to the few. I will not take on the burden of the masses. I am not Jesus and I am not God. But I know that one at a time, we can make a huge difference, right? And if one reaches one and that one reaches thousands, hello. So we, we look at the war on addiction as a war. It's a giant war. And there is t Teen Challenge strategically placed all over the world. And in each center, um, we do battle. And each family, each family at Beauty for Ashes, I have a women and children's home, but each individual male, female, adolescent, mother with a child, um, represents a different battle. And they have battles in their life. And we literally face and win one battle one high five at a time. And then we face the next battle and the next. And before you know it, their war is over. And that war, that victory, becomes a victory for a family, someone else at the center. And that's what keeps us going. And, um, you know, there's been so much talk about the call of God on our lives. Going along with call is commitment. The no quit, I will not quit. It's a commitment to what God has ordained for your life, and you can, never, you can never go back on that. If you quit, were you truly called? Do you hear me? Also, it's a commitment to allow God to use you no matter what. So it's a commitment to the call, to share the gospel, to see lives change, to do the no matter what, but also to not operate. You're committed not to operate in your own giftings. Rather, you're committed to operating under the anointing of God. That's where the no quit comes. That God pours iron in our souls to not quit. And I think that this COVID thing even, even I was telling my husband in November, like we got through so much of it. Come November, I felt like I was getting pushed over a COVID cliff because one of our pregnant moms tested positive for COVID two days before she was to be induced. And I go through labor and delivery and stay in the hospital the whole time with these moms. And I would be sacrificing Thanksgiving with my family. But for the call of God on my life, I would not send that mom into a hospital room to be isolated, to have a baby sick by herself. And God protected me. I didn't get COVID. I had my family. 
and that mom held that baby in her arms the entire time we were hospitalized and I got to care for her because the hospital staff couldn't because we were in isolation. So what I'm saying is, is like, it, it's absolutely amazing because you come into Teen Challenge with a drug problem like Anatol was saying. And every, I bet you that every one of us can speak to this. I came in to get off of drugs, but God had so much more in store for me. That's where our commitment, like, it's way bigger than getting off of drugs. Way bigger. We cannot give up. We cannot grow weary in well-doing. It's Jesus and him and him alone. Greg Dill, how do you deal with students? Yeah, yeah. And there's a nice drawing of you, too. I don't know if they were watching you the whole session. It's very intricate. It's got every hair on your head. Um, how do you deal with uh, recovering addicts who have been hurt by the church? How do, you, how do you deal with people that come in with that baggage? And you're talking to them that Christ is the center, Christ is the answer, and the church has hurt them. Yeah, um, unfortunately, that's just, you know, tough situation. Sorry that it happens. My answer to that would be the same when I'm talking to a student that's uh, been hurt by a buckethead staff, you know, uh, a staff that should have been fired, you know, months ago that wasn't, um, and does more damage, you know, than even remote good. And uh, not excusing them, but just trying to help the student understand the situation, and this would be the same in, in a church setting. Nobody, the pastor didn't take a God test and have to pass it to be the pastor. And a staff member at Teen Challenge doesn't take a God test. Hopefully God, you know, ordained them to be there, and then the ones that aren't, we help them move along and find something else in life. Um, but it, before they are, you know, removed, you know, they didn't take a God test to be there. And my point in saying that to them is man's going to make mistakes because we're men. We're not God. You know, and there's going to be the moment where I'm not going to talk to you right. You know, I, I mentioned it in my session. I'm sure over 40 years I've dismissed somebody from the program unjustly. They should not have been dismissed. I didn't do that maliciously. I just did that because I'm human and I made a bad choice. I read the, you know, the situation wrong. I didn't get enough information, whatever. I messed up. And I, you know, and we're human. So I would counsel that person just to understand, hey, I would hope that, that whatever happened to you was not malicious. It just was in their humanness. They were wrong. It shouldn't have happened. I'm sorry that it did happen, but it did. We're not going to change that. And use the old adage, you know, you can't cry over spilt milk. It happened. We can't change it. Let's take today. Let's fortify, let's educate, let's change so that you're better tomorrow. So, that, you know, I think the worst thing to do is to minimize or excuse. We need to own it. You know, own it. And then try to help that person heal from that time on. But if we try to minimize, excuse, then I think that we're just sort of adding to the problem. Because they'll see through that. Uh, we just have to say, hey, man, yeah, stupid. <laughs> Shouldn't have happened. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have said it. Pastors shouldn't act that way. Youth pastors shouldn't have touched her. You know, whatever wrong decision that guy made, you know, we just have to own it and then try to help that person move past that point. Gail, this one's for you. And I don't your your picture has a bucket over his head. I don't know if <laughs> you just said bucket head on purpose and then they just drew it. I like that one, Buckethead. I don't think I've heard that one. <laughs> uh, how do you unplug uh, to survive as long as you, ha you guys have in ministry? Uh, you got frustrating days. You got frustrating weeks. How do you unplug, and what are some of the signs that you need to unplug? In other words, instead of getting to the point where it's like, yeah, I've got, are there things you recognize that you need to in advance? 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I could go backwards with this. The signs are, ask the people around you. They'll tell you you need to unplug. Um, you know yourself. If you don't know yourself, that's the first thing. You need to take some time and get to know yourself and know when you need. But you got to have boundaries, um, healthy boundaries, just, you know, your priorities when it says God first, family, then ministry. Um, that doesn't change. That hasn't changed. And if you truly have God first and you're keeping these priorities in order, um, life is much better, obviously. You've got to have boundaries where, you know, we we know our lives. We will get a phone call at 11 o'clock at night. He'll get them at 4. I'll get them at 11 o'clock at night. He gets them at 4 in the morning. And that's that's life. But at the same time, you have to shut things off and you have to know it's okay to put the phone away. It's okay to tell yourself how do you ask the staff questions. How would you handle this? Start enabling them to um, take the power to do it. But you have to you have to have your boundaries of what you're going to do and when you're going to take your time. And then we were even joking, you know, as you get into this longer and longer, when we started in ministry, um, health care, uh, personal care, ministers taking care of themselves, ministers taking care of their families, it was non-existent. You were not. It was holier to work 80 hours a week, and we did work 80 hours a week. And it, it, it wasn't, ex and, and as this new generation is coming, I'm loving it because they are doing an awesome ministry, but they are making sure that they're taking time with their family and they're making sure that they're people. And so, you know, I know our staff have vacation time coming and we've got it. So we're looking at it and saying, hey, you haven't taken vacation this year. No, no. Well, can I? No, get out. Ask your staff, ask your family, ask your spouse, look at your kids. If they say, man, you're always grouchy. There's a problem. There's really a problem. They could be a brat, but there's still a problem. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's it's the boundaries, uh, scriptural boundaries, like we said, you know, God first, making sure you have your time with God, your quiet time, my quiet times. What Greg's has his quiet times. He loves to go hunting and sit. I don't hunt. I don't go fishing. That's not my quiet time is sitting and reading. I have a couple craft hobbies things like that, doing stuff with my kids. But what you, you have to have things that you enjoy that are not Teen Challenge. Our realization was probably about 10 years ago. I don't know when, when our empty nest really started kicking. I mean, you had empty nest, but they really didn't leave type thing. Well, then we really had empty nest. <laughs> and um, we had known it was coming and we'd go out to eat. And I said, let's just challenge ourselves tonight. We're not gonna talk about kids and we're not gonna talk about Teen Challenge. And that first day was really quiet. <laughs> You've just eliminated my bloodstream and my veins. I'm not sure what you left. Don't talk about your kids. Or your so then we were like, you know, have we, we dream, but is it all the visions of the ministry? Are we dreaming about what we're going to do together? Is it dreaming about what our future for our kids? And we had to start that all over again. And we've had no regrets for the ministry and, and anything. We... He took time. I w worked at home during the ministry time with, for, because I do the accounting and stuff. I worked at home and took care of my kids and was able to juggle schedules all the time. I'm a night owl, so if I had to work till 3 in the morning, that's what I did. He's the morning bird. He'd get up and handle the kids in the morning, and I'd get that hour of sleep that I wasn't getting because I stayed up too late. And, um, and we've, worked, we've worked through it, and we have no regrets. We were there for our kids' baseball games, and they had them six nights a week. Um, we did all that, but you've got to have your boundaries. You got to schedule it. You know, the planners that everybody hates. I love the paper planner. I just brought it back. I got to see it on paper. I'm so sick of looking at a phone and a computer. So anyway, boundaries, boundaries, you know. Fun, fun. Somebody else want to answer that? And yeah. We, well, one of the things that we went through the same thing with the empty nest and we just decided that we would go ahead and keep, you know, working hard and pressing in all the time, but we were going to go away. And so we have gone away yeah, every quarter for at least a week. And when I mean away, I mean the Caribbean. I don't mean like, you know what I mean? We, we've really enjoyed the last, and we have three adult children in full-time ministry. We didn't lose any of our kids during any of this. All three of our kids are in full-time ministry. You hear me? Serving God, sold out full of the Holy Ghost, same spirit that we have. And there's only one reason, and that's because we, we weren't going to sacrifice them on the altar of ministry. I wasn't going to grow up 
my kids were not going to grow up the way I grew up. I'm a PK. I'm an MK. Missionary kid, pastor's kid. And my dad was that guy that it's more important than anything, than anything. And so now I'm not going to throw you under the bus, Pop, just in case you're freaking me out. I love my heritage, and I'm thankful for it. But, again, it's a generational thing, and that's the way they were raised. And, and now in our generation, you know, now we're, our wives are with us full time. I mean, we, we have a lot in common. We're two years behind them in full time, but we have a lot in common. We've done this together. We've done this together. Well, it's because at 58, I still look like I'm 20. I wasn't raised in the ministry. I was raised in a firefighter's home and the camaraderie of the fire department and the big family of the fire department. And, um, and my dad shift work and, and he, he, and yeah, I've raised Lutheran, but, um, he, he, he made, he made my mom and us girls, I have two sisters, his priority. And he respected my mom and he showed that in the home. And, um, there was never a time where I felt insecure growing up when it came to my mom and my dad. And um, I was introduced to the ministry at 14 years old of Teen Challenge and, and the lifestyle of ministry and so on and so forth. It took me a hot minute to get adjusted to the difference in the way our families were. My dad was rescuing people too. You know, he's a firefighter. And, um, but but we, we just were always first. And, um, and then we put the two lives together and and we talked young we fell in love at 14 and 15 and got married at 18 and 19 and we talked young about what our family was going to look like and what michael said earlier um you know we we determined as a couple that we would not sacrifice our children on the altar of ministry that that was not god's way and that he would not honor us um and and um, also, I want to add to what Gail said. The boundaries are so important. Um, there are seasons in your ministry, like when you guys faced disaster and you, you had an intensity about how you had to serve in order to, to, to accomplish what God had called you to do. There are seasons in ministry like that where you communicate and you know it's going to be 24-7 for a hot minute. And it's going to take something out of you that only God can give you the reserve to make it through. But you have to communicate and you have to work through it. And, and we've had those seasons. We're not really in that season now. So we are, but we aren't. But we, we will not talk about teen challenge once we're both home. If Mike goes there, I say, we should have talked about that today during the day. <laughs> I, I can't go to bed on this. I'm not doing it. Or, but so then we would save it for the next day. And now if it's an emergency, that's different. That's different. But if it's not, don't bring it up because we're going to say the same exact thing to one another. And we've learned how to communicate outside of that and reserve our evenings just for us um, and, and weekends as well. Also, we have on-call staff. We literally have everybody. I have an on-call evening so that my staff knows they don't have to look at their cell phone at all. And I know I don't have to on certain evenings. So you literally shift the responsibilities around. Now, if again, it's a serious emergency, then it's gonna come through to us. But we're really, really mindful and careful of that. And, and you need to do that. You need to do that for your, own, for your own health. Also, your cell phone should not be your business phone. <laughs> don't give your cell phone number out to everybody. No one should have your cell phone number outside of your intimate circle within the ministry and your intimate circle of, of friends. So, seriously, if I see a number that I don't recognize, I don't answer it. And if it's important, they'll leave a message. And if it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't involve me, I'll give that phone number to the staff member that it does. Seriously. You... You can't, you can't do it. You can't do it. You have to draw the line, healthy boundaries. Otherwise, there'll be nothing of you left to give. All your best fruit will be robbed from your tree. And when it's important for you to give your best, you won't be able to. Something else I want to add, if I may. So this is a little off, but something we've really started encouraging with our staff, because as we said, we vacation didn't happen, um, they, all these different things, um, is our circle of friends. 
our, as we've gotten older, it's affected us more. So we're trying to help the newer generation starting. Um, our circle of friends have been Teen Challenge, and they are our best friends, and they are lifelong friends. But there's a lot of them that have dropped off. They're gone. They weren't just your season of life. But like you thought they were best friends, you're like with you for years, and then something happens, and they gone. And you're standing there and you're thinking, where's all my friends? And it's not healthy. Um, not only for that reason, but it's just not healthy that you sit down at a table and you talk about Teen Challenge and Teen Challenge and Teen Challenge and teen cha Adult and Teen Challenge. And so you need a different circle of friends. And we've had our staff connecting with their churches. Whatever church you're going to, you need to be in their small group. You need to be making outside friends. Learn how to talk to people that are not Teen Challenge people and know all the stories. Learn how to be human again almost. It's like, whoa, I went to a small group with a group of women and I was like, I'm not gonna talk about Teen Challenge, we're not. And she even says, oh, can you start a small group with a bunch of women? And I was like, no! And I was like, I didn't mean to be rude, but no, this is my, I, I'm learning to get away. And you need to have that circle of friends. Obviously Teen Challenge is your friends, hopefully they are anyway, but um, connect because it's for your health. It's for your longevity. Um, it makes you last longer because you have other sources. Okay, we got about five minutes left. If you have a, a card, send it up, and, and I'm happy to read it. Uh, Brother A, how would you define enabling? What is enabling? What does that mean to enable somebody? You can stand up if you don't mind. Okay, so, so enabling is always coming to someone's rescue and rescuing them from the consequences really that they need uh, to have to endure in order to get to a place where they really want help and want their life to change. And so, and of course, in Teen Challenge, consistently you're dealing with uh, enabling parents or loved ones uh, that are consistently going to the rescue uh, of the loved one. And as long as you're rescuing me, I don't have a need to change. Mm -hmm. If I know you're going to be there to, to, to rescue me, uh, there's no reason for, for me to change. The whole point of consequences is, to, is, is for us to get to a point that we want to do something different, that we want to change. And, and, and so it's important that we don't enable people, especially, and it doesn't just relate, I don't think it just relates to, to uh, recovery. I think it relates to parenting in a huge way. Uh, if you're enabling your, 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 your children and all, all, always coming to uh, their rescue and blocking them from having to deal with the consequences of their behavior, uh, then you're just telling them, just keep doing what you, you always have done, and I'll just rescue you every time you, yeah. Um, and so they need to face the consequences. They need to deal with that uh, in order to get the help they need or to, or to focus on what they need to do to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Else on enabling? Good. Especially financially. Especially financially. I think a lot of moms and dads have accidentally killed their kids without realizing it. Just bailing them out. You can live in the basement like for I'm free. Enabling you right now. Yeah. You can live in here. <laughs> you can live in say you can live in the basement for free. You can you know, mom and dad, the ATM machine have killed a lot of people, a lot of their children, indirectly. And that's hard. Look, I get a mother's love and I get a father's love. But man, you, you, there's not going to be change until there's rock bottom, rock bottom. And as long as you're throwing cash at it, there's never going to be a rock bottom. I mean, we, we, we've, had, we've had a couple individuals, we got a couple now in the program right now in their 40s, 50s, 60s. I know a 60-year-old one still living with mama, oh, yeah. and the mama is still enabling them. I've had a couple of them here twice, once in their 20s and then again in their 40s, another one here in their 40s and again in their 60s. And they're still living with mama. And mom still don't understand why they can't get it together. And, I, and, I, and more than once I've had to say, you're a part of the problem, you're not a part of the solution. Because you keep rescuing them and, and instead of allowing them to deal with the consequences of how they're choosing to live their life. I think that we have to be really careful also um, as staff with this because the residents will look for anyone who they can connect with and feel, you know, familiarity with. So oftentimes when we have um, interns or 
um, our, we hire staff that have gone through Teen Challenge, um, there's a good possibility that if you're not training them properly that they're going to find themselves enabling um, students in the program. We've had problems with that over the years where they want they want to remain friends or, or you know, the camaraderie and all those kinds of things and, and, and they go into an enabling relationship and then, you know, you have problems, you know, right within your center. Um, one thing that our staff does uh, right away, and we have meetings with our new residents and we say, um, just so you know, we're not going to enable you here, and um, you're not. We're not codependent. We we don't need you, like you know. And and you're not going to manipulate us. We're one force, and we all are on the same page. So don't try to play one of us over another. We're here for you to to get well. And um, so you know when that feels uncomfortable. When you can't run to someone and, and, and you know, y they get a discipline and they want to talk to you immediately. Like, oh, blah, 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 and then you're like, no, we can do this tomorrow and they got to think all night. You know what I'm saying? Feel what they need to feel. Take responsibility and ownership for their part in it. All those kinds of things. And that's really important that, you know, we, we don't become the enablers or we're not codependent. All right, last question. Uh, this one's about a specific drug, but uh, I'm going to broaden it a little bit. Um, some of you guys, we've got a lot of experience up here. The drugs that you were dealing with in the program when you first started in Teen Challenge were illegal, and now they're not illegal anymore. How do you deal with the mindset of the addict that is in a culture that has legalized a lot of things we've been fighting against? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's not. I don't even know if there's a test for. Well, I think they just came out with tests. Yeah, right. It was the same thing like a few years ago with K two. That is legalizing a lot of things that you began in Teen Challenge. Sure. Talking to students about this is illegal. Yeah, well, alcohol has always been legal, and we've had plenty of alcoholics come through Teen Challenge, and so. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, drugs brings people to Teen Challenge, but because it's a spiritual program, you know, all this lines up with God's word of just being separate, it's just, you know. But it is, uh, th that's a challenge. I mean, w we were just at a wedding. I mean, I think we were the only ones there not drinking. Just there's a handful of people not drinking. Yeah, the bride and groom, Teen Challenge graduates, they're, it was so cool to be at this wedding last Sunday and see everybody, you know, getting hammered and just see this beautiful couple up there not touching it. Um, I mean, there are legal yeah. drugs that are used illegally. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, so, so yeah, we're, not, we're not doing it because you're criminal. Yeah, right. So you can get anything on the streets. And, and but again, I think that would be a greater challenge if our program wasn't so closely tied to faith and a different way to live. It's a different way to live. And that's what we're teaching the people that come into our program, our students. We're teaching them a different way to live separate from the way the world lives. So you don't have to smoke pot just because it's legal. You don't have to drink just because it's legal. It's a, it's a separate, that's what's so unique about Teen, teen Challenge is not rehab. Come on, what a joke. We're not rehabbing anybody. This is a different lifestyle. We're giving you a chance at a whole new life in Christ. And part of that is forsaking the world's way. And if the world legalizes cocaine, which is probably gonna, Portugal did started all this. And Canada has followed suit with the free needles. And now New York is following. They're gonna, they've already legalized cocaine in Washington state. Most people don't even know that. Trade, you know, for individual amounts. Same deal. And so we keep lowering the standard, but Teen Challenge can never lower the standard because it's a God thing. And so whatever the world does, the world does. They just don't, the truth is, they don't know what to do. You know. I don't think it's just the legalization of it. When you, you, when you legalize it, it also uh, for, it becomes socially acceptable. And so one of the things I often talk with students about is what I call not, not, not comparing but identifying. And what I mean by that is, is what happens is often they're looking at the social network that they're with and they're saying, well, hey, if he can drink, I should be able to drink. If he can do this, I should be able to do this. And they're comparing themselves with other people. So identifying is is being reminded of what happens when you do it. The problems that it's causing in your life 
when you do it, how it has destroyed your relationships, how you've, the jobs you've lost, the consequences that you've had to deal with. Every time you drink, you get arrested. Every time you use, this happens. You need to identify with that rather than compare yourself with what everybody else is doing. If everybody else go up on top of this billion, building and jump, is it the right thing to do? Uh, uh, they're going to deal with the consequences of that, and so will you if you follow them, comparing yourself to them. And, 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 and so that's bringing, that's kind of helping them have that reality check. You, you got to decide you can't do it, even if everybody else is doing it. Well, uh, I know I can speak for you, and, and uh, hopefully, and I speak for myself, I'm better today because of sitting under you guys and listening and last night. So thank you guys for sharing your wisdom and experience. All you guys are ahead of me in this, in this uh, race here in Team Challenge and in working with addicts. And so just to be able to sit and listen over the last two days has been a huge blessing to me. And I know uh, all of us should be uh, grateful for these guys as well. So thank you guys. Uh, I'm going to say a prayer of dismissal. And then uh, we're done officially. If you want to come up and talk one-on-one -on -one with any of our, our speakers or obviously stick around. We're here all afternoon, so there's no rush out the door. Uh, make sure you take your Kit Kat with you. Don't leave it here. We don't need it. We don't want the temptation. Eat it. Leave with it. Uh, but thank you for being here. Thank you for spending your day. It, it really means a lot that you would spend a day talking about something that, you know, a lot of people just don't want to spend time talking about, thinking about, and dealing with. And so uh, it means a lot that you'd be here today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each one of these individuals that have been with us the last two days and mission-driven, Lord, last night and today. Lord, I thank you, Father, for the heart behind their, their presence, Lord, and their willingness to, to be on the front lines educating themselves, learning, putting themselves out there, serving, Lord. I pray, bless their ministry. Uh, bless the fathers and mothers here that are dealing with addiction in their families, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that lives would be changed as a result of the words, the word of God that had been spoken today and yesterday. Lord, I pray for our CRs and our churches around this city and around the United States, Lord, these ones here, bless them in their ministry to addicts coming in. Don't even know why they're in the church, but Lord, they begin to hear the gospel and lives are changed. Be with our Teen Challenge leaders represented up front, those Teen Challenge leaders and staff seated here. Keep them encouraged, Lord God. Lord, that one that's discouraged and wondering about their calling today, Lord, in this room, I pray. Lord, let them catch the anointing of these ones around them, Lord God, and be re-energized with a passion to reach lives broken by addiction. And God, as we've said all along yesterday and today, this is your ministry. This is your work. Lord, we give it back to you. Lord, you are the answer. We thank you, Father God, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.